I'm sure they will. All right. Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, my name is Mina Lele. I work with the company Little Mixins. Um, I'm very excited to offer this opportunity for you all to learn with one of the greatest. Um, Dr. Anik Nastu is um, a allergist, a specialist in your practice. And I won't speak for very long other than to tell you that um, you're welcome to ask questions. There's a question panel at the bottom in your side panel where you can type in questions. Um, at the end of the discussion, or at the end of the presentation, we will go through some Q&A as time allows. And this webinar will be recorded. So for those of you who want to refer back to the information that was given, um, or for those of you who want to be able to pass it on to some of your colleagues, you will be able to do so. Um, and without further ado, I will um, pass this over. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Anna Gnostu and I'm an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital. I have a special interest in food allergies. I'm an allergist and uh, specifically for food allergy prevention and also immunotherapy. So I was asked by Dr. Spinner to give this presentation with a special focus on early food introduction and how our guidelines have recently changed with regards to this for infants. So the topics that we will be covering today uh, include some information on food allergy prevalence and the atopic march. We will discuss the role that eczema or atopic dermatitis plays early in life. We will speculate a little bit about theories behind the recent rise of food allergies. And then we will focus on how to evaluate a young patient that comes to your practice for a well child visit at uh, four months of age and how uh, we are going to advise the family on food introduction. And of course, we will refer to the early introduction peanut guidelines that were recently uh, published by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So starting with food allergy prevalence, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this and you must see a lot of kids with food allergies in your practices. We know that the number of children with food allergies in the United States and also in other westernized countries has been increasing steadily over the last uh, 10 years plus and currently we have one in 13 children in the US with a food allergy. So that is approximately two children in each classroom. And since this phenomenon was observed in other westernized countries and not just the US, we are pretty much talking about a global epidemic with regards to food allergies. What is very interesting is that although there are hundreds of allergens around us and a very large number of food allergens, more than 90% of allergic reactions are caused by eight food allergens. And these are milk, egg, soy, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. So the majority of allergic reactions are caused by those eight uh, only. The atopic march is where um, eczema sort of factors in, in the context of food allergies. And it's a phrase that is being used very frequently by allergists. It refers to this concept that atopic disorders progress over time. So somebody who starts early on in life with atopic dermatitis uh, may or may not progress in the future to develop other allergic conditions, such as for instance, allergic rhinitis, asthma, and food allergies. So not all eczema will lead to food allergy. That's important to highlight. But on the other hand, there are certain types of eczema that are more likely to lead to food allergies. And this is early onset eczema. And you will find different definitions for early onset, but for most people, it's below six months of age. And also more severe eczema is also strongly associated with the development of food allergies. Again, it's not very easy to define severe eczema. We will talk about this a little bit further, but generally eczema that requires a strong topical corticosteroid treatment to maintain good control would be considered severe eczema. There have been various different studies uh, looking at whether there is a way to prevent infants from developing eczema. 
And fairly recently, in the last couple of years or so, a couple of studies came out that basically stressed that if you're using emollients on a proactive uh, way, especially when the infant is quite young, then this may help prevent eczema development. And what is really interesting is that uh, those infants who would benefit did not necessarily show any signs of eczema at birth. So they didn't necessarily present with dry or inflamed skin. But it was found that using the moisturizer on a regular basis uh, may help them. So moving on to different theories uh, behind the rise of food allergies. There are a lot of them around. The most popular ones I have listed here, so is the uh, dual exposure hypothesis, the hygiene hypothesis, and of course, more recently, the timing of food introduction. So starting with the dual exposure hypothesis, uh, there have been studies that show that if you expose, uh, especially eczematous or broken skin to allergen early on in life, and this particular study that uh, brought it out uh, referred to the application of peanut oil on broken skin, then this uh, process can be sensitizing and the infant uh, may start developing a specific IgE to that particular allergen. However, if you introduce the allergen orally, this could potentially induce tolerance of the allergen. And what came out of this study and was very interesting at the time, and of course still is, is that different routes of exposure result in different outcomes. The hygiene hypothesis has been around for a very long time. It now has also been associated with uh, microbiome changes. Microbiome is a, an area of intense interest currently in research. The whole idea behind the hygiene hypothesis is that our lifestyle has changed significantly uh, in recent times. We live in clean environments, hyperhygienic environments, as uh, they've also been called, where our exposure to viruses, bacteria, is actually very minimal. And that results in the immune system not really what, knowing what to do with itself because it doesn't have to fight so many uh, bacteria and viruses anymore. So it starts uh, kind of fighting itself and it starts uh, behaving in a way that is not uh, appropriate and considering uh, things like food allergens as enemies and starting uh, mounting reactions to uh, these allergens, whereas in the past, uh, this wouldn't have happened. Like I mentioned before, a lot of interest in the microbiome and there have been various and multiple studies looking at different factors that could affect uh, the microbiome. And this include obviously the antenatal, prenatal period, but also the infant period and the environment early on in life and subsequently. This is the um, area I'm gonna to focus today, the timing of food introduction, uh, which uh, reflects our new guidelines as well. So generally advice about food introduction has not been consistent. If anything, it has been very variable. Uh, starting from the 1960s, where the average age for food introduction, allergenic food introduction was two months, and moving on to later years when there was continuously delay in introducing allergenic foods. So the advice that came out of the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2000 and also uh, other bodies around the world was uh, to delay allergenic food introduction to the age of one to three years, especially in those children uh, who were considered at risk to developing food allergies. However, our view on this has changed uh, recently and we now uh, know from uh, studies that there may be an opportunity for tolerance induction early on in life. And the window of opportunity varies potentially for different food allergies. It has been researched uh, mostly for peanut, but it is thought that allergenic food introduction should be introduced uh, from four months onwards, provided of course the infant is ready for this. And any delay in introduction could potentially result in the development of food allergies. 
Our data and information with regards to peanut introduction has come from this study called the LEAP study, which stands for learning early about peanut allergy. This was a study that was conducted in the United Kingdom and recruited over 600 infants between the ages of four to 11 months. And all these infants had severe eczema or egg allergy or both. And the investigators divide them into two groups. One was a group that had a negative skin test to peanuts, and the other was a group that had a, a wheel, a positive wheel to peanut between one to four millimeters. If the infants had a wheel, a positive result over four millimeters, they were considered peanut allergic and they were not included in this study. The group of infants was then randomized to either consuming peanuts or avoiding peanuts. And the advice for the consumption group was to eat two grams of peanuts at least twice a week. The advice for the avoidance group was to avoid peanuts completely for 60 months. At that point, the infants would undergo a food challenge where peanut is uh, given to them in a controlled hospital environment to see if they will have an allergic reaction and to assess whether they are allergic or not to peanut. The results of this study were, I would say, rather unexpected because it was shown that in the avoidance group, the rate of developing peanut allergy was way, way higher than anybody would expect compared with the group who was consuming peanut regularly. So this was a study uh, that uh, in a way encouraged people to look again at food introduction guidelines and resulted in the new guidelines that were published encouraging people to introduce peanut and potentially other allergenic foods early on in life. Like I mentioned before, there have been some other studies for different food allergens. Uh, they were not as well designed or controlled as the LEAP study, which is why we don't have as much data and information for other food allergens. But a meta-analysis that was done in 2016 showed benefits of early introduction for other food allergens, such as egg and milk. And I know that there are also current well-designed studies that are looking at this right now to potentially provide us with more information on other food allergens. The interesting uh, observation that came out was that there was no decrease in breastfeeding rates with early food allergenic introduction. And obviously this is a, a significant observation because parents and healthcare professionals often worry that by introducing foods early, uh, you may encourage um, discontinuation of breastfeeding, but this did not appear to be the case, at least in the research setting. So coming to a patient evaluation at four months visit, what are the important things to consider? Well, I would say that the first step would be to think about the new guidelines and how the, the infant is, is placed depending on the guidelines. As you can see, there are uh, three different options depending on uh, the infant's uh, condition with regards to eczema and egg allergy. So first, those infants who have severe eczema or egg allergy, meaning an allergic reaction to egg, or both, are considered high risk for development of peanut allergy. So for these infants, it is advised that evaluation is performed with a specific IG and if necessary, based on the result, oral food challenge. So we as allergists tend to see quite a lot of those infants. And based on the test results, we will decide whether we can potentially introduce peanut uh, in a controlled environment or whether this is not indicated because the test results may be so high that we are pretty certain the infant is already allergic. Then there is a second group of infants who have mild to moderate eczema, but no history of egg allergy. So for those infants, it is advised that peanut containing food may be introduced around the age of six months. And there is a third group of infants who have no eczema or any food allergy, and those are very low risk. So they can introduce peanut containing food as appropriate and of course in accordance with family preferences and cultural practices. 
So when uh, an infant is seen for a full month well visit, it's worth um, screening for eczema, asking about any potential reactions, uh, suggesting the presence of egg allergy or any other food allergy. And at the same time, it's also worth determining how ready the infant is for introduction of solids, because we all know that this can vary from child to child and not everybody's ready to start eating allergenic food at the age of four months. We generally prefer that any infant with severe eczema or history of food allergy, especially egg allergy, is referred to us for evaluation and appropriate testing because this is the high risk group, as I mentioned before. And we would really prefer it if panels of food specific IG are not performed before we see the infant. The reason for this is that a lot of times uh, those results do not suggest allergy, true allergy, just sensitization. But once a panel of foods is performed, we often find that parents become very anxious and they start cutting foods out of the infant diet or delaying the introduction of foods. So if we can avoid this, it would be um, absolutely wonderful and very beneficial for the families as well. The um, NIAID definition of severe eczema is uh, eczema that is uh, persistent or is recurring frequently, having frequent flare-ups with typical morphology and distribution for age and eczema that requires a frequent need for strong topical corticosteroids or calcineurin inhibitors in order to be controlled. And it's important to ascertain whether the family and the caregiver is already applying regular emollients because that does make a significant change in how we assess eczema. There are a lot of different scoring systems. The SCORAD system, which is uh, widely available online, is one that is very commonly used. And it comes with uh, little images that can help parents and families to assess severity of eczema. Uh, I generally uh, do not advise people doing very complicated scoring because um, I usually find that if someone has significant severe eczema, it is usually fairly um, obvious when the child is seen. But of course, anybody who wants to do that is, is very welcome. Generally, the total score of zero to 15 suggests very mild eczema or mild eczema. Between 15 and 40 is the moderate eczema and over 40 is the severe type eczema. It is important to educate the parents appropriately in the four month well visit. And the discussion should focus on the benefits of not delaying appropriate introduction of foods. Also the importance of a healthy, diverse diet. This has also been highlighted in microbiome studies that uh, a healthy, diverse diet starting early on in life is uh, very beneficial from uh, various aspects. A cautious use of antibiotics is something that uh, many people would recommend. Now this doesn't mean not giving a child antibiotics if they have a need for it. But generally, parents tend to ask for antibiotics frequently, especially in case of viral infections. And it would be uh, best if they are not used, if they're not absolutely needed. And it is worth discussing the proactive use of emollients. Like I said, there is some data coming from research studies that suggest that this is beneficial. So let's talk about the practicalities of early food introduction. Um, this is a really nice information leaflet that was designed by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology. Uh, they are very happy to provide it to uh, your clinics uh, if you contact them. And the idea was that the parents would have um, an information leaflet giving them uh, the sort of basic advice about how to introduce allergenic foods. And as you can see, it is recommended that allergenic foods can be introduced between four to six months of age, just like any other solid foods. So what the Academy and um, all of us are trying to do is uh, reverse the thinking from delay of food introduction to early food introduction. 
there are many options for every family. There are a lot of different products that are around in many different forms, in forms of powder that can be mixed in uh, other foods that the child potentially is already eating. Uh, there is peanut butter and there are uh, peanut puffs or um, also known as bamba. So the families can choose uh, whatever is most convenient for them to use. It's important to remember that uh, very young infants uh, should never be introduced to nuts because there is a risk of choking. And it's also important to remember that thick peanut butter is also a risk of choking for young infants. So it has to be diluted in water or a different uh, vehicle before uh, being given to the infant. The serving sizes in order to provide the necessary dose uh, for uh, the uh, uh, desired outcome preventing peanut allergy uh, is stated here for the most uh, common uh, allergenic vehicles that are given to infants. So it's either two teaspoonfuls of peanut butter, uh, 21 sticks of bamba, which is pretty much a small pack of those peanut puffs, or two teaspoons of peanut powder. The, calori the, the caloric uh, content of all of these foods is shown on this slide. And for those parents who are absolutely against their infant having any sugar or salt, uh, the only available uh, sort of opportunity for this would be uh, peanut powder because generally peanut powder is uh, defatted and does not contain any sugar or salt either. So the American Academy has also brought out some feeding instructions, especially for low risk infants who are, are going to have their peanut introduction performed in the home environment. Again, this is available online and it can be printed and provided to the parents. Just looking through it uh, in a more systematic way, there are some general instructions about how to feed the infant. It's important to say to them that the infant should be introduced to a new food when they are well. So it is not advised that the new food is introduced when the infant has a cold or vomiting or diarrhea or any illness whatsoever. The first peanut feeding ideally should be done at home not at a daycare facility or a restaurant or any other sort of environment where the parents will not be able to focus their attention to the infant. And it's important that there are no distractions so that there is at least one adult person in the house who will be able to focus their attention on the baby and make sure that uh, the whole introduction goes well and there are no symptoms of any allergic reactions. And it is advised that at least two hours after the feeding should be spent with a parent. This is the usual window that uh, we see immediate allergic reactions to peanut. Another uh, important uh, point is that a full portion um, should be given, but in a graded way. So initially, uh, the parents can offer the baby a small uh, part of the peanut serving. They can put a little bit of uh, peanut on the tip of the spoon, a peanut butter or anything else they want to introduce. Again, mixed with appropriate vehicle, depending on the age of the infant. And the advice is to wait for 10 minutes, but if there's no allergic reaction seen and there are no allergic uh, symptoms, then the remainder of the food can be given at the infant's usual eating speed. So ideally, you don't want to give this over, say, an hour. That would be a long time. But at the same time, different babies eat in a different pace. So you don't want to rush them either. I've already mentioned about the danger of choking with whole nuts and peanut butter, and this is also something that should be highlighted to the parents, and it, all of this information is in that information leaflet I showed you before. Now, we cannot assume that the parents know what to look out for. So families who have a previous child with food allergy or have a relative with food allergies uh, may or may not be familiar with the signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction. But generally, uh, we need to at least give them some basic information about what an allergic reaction looks like. So again, all this information is in that leaflet, but mild symptoms can include the development of a new rash or hives developing around the mouth or the face or other parts of the body. And then more severe symptoms will include swelling, especially lip swelling, uh, vomiting, 
hives that are generalized and spread all over the body, any difficulty breathing, wheeze, repetitive coughing, and in very severe cases, uh, change in skin color and sudden lethargy or the infant seeming limp. I have to say that fortunately, those last uh, two are uh, very rare, especially in the young infant uh, age, and that is uh, fairly reassuring for most parents. So I didn't want to spend the whole time with just me talking about research and evidence. I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So if you would like to send your questions now, I would be um, happy to go through them and answer them. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was a wonderful overview, I think, of uh, where all of the science and, and thinking is today. I think we have a couple questions in already. So um, if I may start um, going through questions. I think the first one we have is, uh, do you recommend, uh, this coming from uh, your primary care colleagues, do you recommend us doing anything for severe atopic infants while waiting to get into allergy? For example, those that have uh, a peanut component panel and a severe eczema, uh, their experience is that they can lose precious months in the process of waiting for patients to get an appointment with allergy and immunology. So again, so what should they do if uh, patients have, are having a hard time getting in to see an allergist? What can the pediatrician do in the meantime? Yeah, that is an excellent question. And I think it highlights the difficulties that come with screening programs, not only for peanut allergy, but for obviously um, other diseases. There may or may not be a delay in seeing the infant. Uh, I have to say the process is getting a lot smoother and easier. There are a lot of providers currently that are willing to uh, see infants that are considered high risk for peanut allergy and obviously other allergic disorders. And we try to prioritize uh, these babies from being seen just to avoid this delay in food introduction. Now, with regards to the question of what to do, uh, the only thing that I would potentially like to see if I was referred a patient with severe eczema or egg allergy at high risk for peanut allergy, is a specific IgE to peanut only. So food panels are not gonna help us. A peanut specific IgE will be helpful. We have guidelines uh, on how to um, address different levels of peanut specific IgE. So if you would like to do something for the family, this uh, would be something that would help us, but I would advise against, like I said multiple times, and I'm sorry if this is repetitive, but it's important, against food allergy panels in general. Okay, great, thank you. So, that, and that is a common refrain from allergists, and I think everyone understands why we want to refrain from food allergy panels. Uh, can you speak to any research you, um, on the incidence? So, if a child is allergic to peanut, what's the probability or likelihood that they have multiple food allergies? How concerned should the, their pediatrician be about uh, other food allergies? So this is again another a great question. It's very difficult to predict for every individual uh, child whether they will or will not develop any other food allergies. Peanut allergy um, often goes hand in hand with egg allergy. And of course the reverse is true. That's how these babies are considered at high risk. So um, I always ask them if they have introduced egg into the diet. Um, if not, then we uh, sometimes screen for egg, depending on the history, but it's not necessarily associated with multiple food allergies. Now, some of these infants, as they grow older, may very well develop other food allergies, especially if they're allergic to peanut. Uh, they are considered slightly at higher risk of development of tree nut allergies, but there are ways for us to address that, and when we see them in the allergy clinic, we will discuss all of that information. There is no sort of validated evidence or any algorithms or anything that could help you predict which ones will be the ones that will develop uh, more food allergies. Okay. Great. Uh, next, uh, two people, the same question, um, which is how often, uh, I know that the term is, you mentioned, I believe is regular exposure to uh, the two teaspoons of infant peanut powder. So how often is regular and how long do you have to keep that going after you've determined you know, no allergy on the first exposure? So how often? We recommend um, three times a week as a minimum. You okay. Have to, you have to continue um, regular exposure, especially in those that are high risk. 
pretty much long term. And what usually we hope that happens uh, in most families is that they, the, the infants would get accustomed to the taste of peanut and then peanut will be introduced as a regular part of the diet and they will start consuming peanut containing products at lib, especially as they get older. But the advice right now is three times a week, long term. And is that the same for other products, or, sorry, other foods like eggs and shellfish? Yeah, so of course, like I mentioned before, that we don't have as much information and data for other foods, but currently most uh, allergists would advise uh, a similar regularity of exposure, let's put it this way, uh, stating that of course we don't have as evidence. So jumping to a little bit of a different topic, what, is, what are the latest recommendations on breastfeeding and maternal diet as they relate to atopic disease? Good point. So with regards to um, the mothers that are pregnant or breastfeeding, we have absolutely no information whatsoever. These are very hard studies to conduct. It's very difficult to uh, create a control group and advise different things without any evidence. So what I say to uh, women currently is to do what their body tells them to do. So basically, if they have if they feel like they want to eat nuts, they should eat them. If the nuts are part of their regular diets and they wish to continue consumption during pregnancy and breastfeeding, they should do so. If they have an aversion to nuts, then they shouldn't. I don't know if my advice is helping in any way, but like I said, we have absolutely no evidence to guide us in this area. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Uh, to, so you said that was with breastfeeding, that's for maternal diet during pregnancy, and then does the same go for breastfeeding? So breastfeeding, we, we continue to recommend uh, the same as the World Allergy Organization, which is basically breastfeeding for the first uh, six months of life at least. And the LEAP study looked into rates of breastfeeding, whether these would be affected by early peanut introduction, and the investigators stated that they were not. Um, so, okay, here's another question. For infants diagnosed with milk protein intolerance, do you have recommendations for when to introduce milk products? Should they avoid all dairy until a year or allow more casual introduction as they start solids if they remain symptom free? So this is obviously not related at all to, um, to the, the topic at hand, but um, what I would say is we would ideally like to see those infants in the clinic because what we might do is uh, potentially try uh, milk introduction after a period of time from diagnosis within the clinic. Generally, uh, most of these will outgrow their kind of non-immediate type allergy to milk. And there are some different types of this allergy. So we would like to see them and advise individually for those. Okay, great. So uh, can you just review again? So if a PCP does a peanut specific IgE and it comes up normal, what do you recommend in terms of introducing peanut in a patient with severe eczema? So someone with severe eczema, but um, you know, no signs or no IgE um, identified allergy. So those infants who have completely negative specific IgE to peanut can introduce peanut. If the Ig is totally negative, uh, the chance of having a reaction to peanut is very small. A lot of times patients and parents may be worried, so one option would be to, to do it at the practice. But generally, like I said, these infants are low risk, so they can have peanut. Okay. Um. Okay, so uh, this is also a great question that comes up a lot. If mom or dad or siblings have a peanut allergy, um, are do we still introduce peanuts to baby at four months without any testing? Yeah, if the, if the infant has no eczema and no history of food allergy, despite the family history, they are considered low risk and they can have peanuts exactly as the guidelines state. So there shouldn't be any, uh, any issues just because of the positive family history. You ha would you change your recommendations on early introduction at all for the infant that has, you know, persistent nasal or chest congestion before the introduction of solids? Yeah, that is a great question, actually. And um, a lot of times I have patients coming to clinic who have been uh, screened for food allergies because of congestion. So 
congestion is not a symptom of food allergies, not something that would predispose you to food allergy. So uh, I would not say that we need to have any special guidelines for those infants. There was this um, sort of almost like a theory in the old days that if you have production of a lot of mucus or if you're congested early on in life, this is a sign of milk allergy, but this is not true. And uh, there, there is no evidence that this is associated or linked with milk allergy or any other food allergies. Um, so the question is, if, if there's signs of eczema, it, uh, sorry, if a patient has eczema, is that indicative of an underlying food allergy? Or perhaps another way of asking that is, um, is eczema caused by food allergy? Not necessarily, and not all infants who have eczema will necessarily be diagnosed with a food allergy. The earlier the eczema presents, and like I said, earlier for most people is less than six months, for some it's even less than three months, and the more severe it is, the more increased the risk of food allergy. But uh, a significant proportion of infants with severe eczema will never develop food allergies. Okay. Um then, okay, does there, does there need to be exposure to peanut for specific IgE to be positive? I'm not sure I understand that. Well, I think, uh, so this is a, quite a lot of question a lot of parents have. If this is the first, if the IgE testing is the quote unquote first time the baby's being exposed to peanut, is it possible, you know, will it, is it possible for it to be positive or will it by definition be negative? Oh, I see, okay. so. With regards to uh, positive IgE, what I always say to the families is that it's important to understand a very big difference here. Having a positive specific IgE doesn't necessarily mean you're allergic. I know that intuitively it should mean that, but it doesn't. So having peanut specific IgE means that in some way your body has encountered peanut. That doesn't necessarily have to be the oral route, so the infant may be very young and have never eaten any peanut. But peanuts can be in the environment, so infants can be exposed from, say, peanut dust and peanut particles that are consumed at home, or it may be, say, the ingredient of a product that is being used on the infant. And having a positive peanut IgE basically means that you are sensitized to peanut, but not necessarily allergic. And that is a really big difference because 50% of people who have a positive specific Ig to any food allergens will actually not be allergic. So having a positive test and having a, a true allergy are two different things. Um, can you clarify, can you expand on that last comment you made about the 50% uh, false or false positive rate? Is that to both uh, skin testing and IgE panels or is it one or the other? Correct, correct. It's for, it's for both skin testing and IgE. If you take a hundred people off the street and skin test them to any food allergen, you will find approximately a 50% false positive rate. That's why it's extremely important to, to have a proper history and also to not uh, screen people if there is no indication from the history that they may have a problem. What, what would you recommend uh, for, for patients that have tolerated the food, for example, peanut, several times and then say on the fifth exposure seem to be um, having an allergic reaction? Yeah, I have encountered this a few times. I have to say it's not the common scenario. Generally, infants who tolerate peanut on uh, multiple feedings will not develop allergy, but I have seen a few uh, that present with peanut allergy. Now this may be because they consume peanut infrequently so there have been families that came to me that said we introduced it for the first few months of life. And when I get into the details of how often the infant was actually eating peanut, it would appear that it was something like maybe once every two weeks or even once a month. Or there was a large period of time where they stopped giving it altogether. So this could be the reason that the allergy developed. But on very rare occasions, uh, there have been situations where their infant was eating peanut on a regular basis. And again, I have to stress, this is very rare. And then developed a, an unexpected allergic reaction. So if there are concerns about an allergic reaction, I would tell them to obviously stop feeding the, the food and come to the clinic. Now, 
there has to be some strong evidence that this is an allergic reaction. So not necessarily something like, oh, we gave peanut for the 15th time and we saw a little bit of redness above the upper lip or something like that, because that's not indicative. But if there is a clear history, uh, then we need to see them. Um, so this the next two questions are really about, um, again, about early introduction. So what is your advice for families who have older children with food allergies? How do you, how do they maintain tolerance for the infant while keeping the house safe for the allergic siblings? This is a very good question and it's again commonly encountered in the clinics. So my first um, advice to the families is to not delay introduction of peanut to the young child because the older child has food allergy. And if anybody would be sensitive to this information, it is those families in particular because they understand the daily burden of food allergy. And the last thing they want is having a second or a third child with a peanut allergy. So the way to approach this is to either uh, have the infant on a sort of separate environment. So for instance, when the oldest child is at school, the young infant is at, is at home with the mom or the caregiver and then peanut can be given at that time and not when the other child is at home also. Uh, and the area can then be cleaned and it's fairly easy to remove peanut allergen from the surfaces. It's not that complicated. Uh, you can use any sort of uh, bleach containing product and the allergen is very easily removed. Obviously situations in which both children are together and the little one is, you know, would touch the peanut butter and then the older child are not are not recommended, but the parents are usually um, pretty good at that. And on most occasions, they come back and they tell me that they have identified windows in their schedule where they can do this for the younger child. Um, what do you recommend for PCPs um, for parents who want testing to be done before they'll introduce peanut or other foods? So parents that are asking for panel testing or pan parents that are asking for peanut testing. So I would explain why this is not indicated, especially for situations where the history is clearly at very low risk. And I would try to convey to them that uh, having a mild or moderately positive result to a food that has never been introduced creates more problems than it actually solves. It's very hard for especially non-medical families to understand what we mean by a false positive uh, rate for a test. And this is not only for uh, allergies, obviously, but uh, for other conditions also in medicine. But the best way to convey this is that a false positive will create a lot more anxiety, which is often not necessary. So I've got a couple questions here, I keep going back to the LEAP study. So would you mind, um, again, kind of going over the details of that a little bit? Uh, the question here is, is it, so are you saying it's possible for a patient to have severe eczema or ag allergy and yet have a negative I, specific IgE to peanut and that for those patients, it's safe to introduce peanut four to six months? Yes, that's correct. So not everybody with severe eczema or egg allergy will have a positive IgE to peanut and will necessarily develop peanut allergy. So for those who present with any one of those risk factors and the specific IgE to peanut is completely negative, then peanut can be introduced into the diet. So the LEAP study uh, took young infants, like I said, between the age of four to 11 months and screened them all with skin prick testing for uh, peanut allergy, which is just another way of testing at the beginning. Anybody who had a very strong positive skin testing in that for the LEAP study was considered uh, above four millimeters was excluded. So those kids were supposed to have peanut allergy at diagnosis. They didn't get included in the study because someone who is already peanut allergic should obviously not introduce peanut on a regular basis or even at all. But, uh, but yes, if someone has a completely negative IG, completely negative skin test, whichever way you, you test them, uh, they can introduce peanut. This is a good question. Um, is there a window of time after an allergic reaction has been observed where a PCP should wait before performing the specific IgE testing? And then, and does that, is that window affected by how the allergic reaction was treated? So for example, if the patient was given steroids or if the patient took Benadryl? 
No, there is no specific window and there's no particular treatment that would affect the level of specific IgE. So a, the specific IgE can be tested at the time of presentation to the PCP or we would test them in the allergy clinic. It, you know, it's, it, it doesn't make any difference there. Okay. And then I think we have one last question here, which is, um, uh, what are the studies saying on the use of emollients? Should all, uh, given the comment about its protective effects, should all infants be recommended the use of emollients or only those with presenting with some signs of eczema? Yeah, so I have to say those studies are not as strong yet to provide kind of worldwide recommendations on skincare. They have suggested that like I said, frequent use of emollients in early life may potentially uh, prevent development of eczema. But what I usually say to the parents is that there is some preliminary evidence to suggest this and it would be worth if they have the time and the inclination to actually moisturize their baby regularly uh, with uh, just a, an over-the-counter uh, moisturizer and that could potentially help. But there's, there's not enough evidence yet to make this a, a blanket recommendation. And as we're nearing the end of our time here, I want to uh, ask the two most important questions, perhaps, which is where can um, the PCPs here, where do you recommend they go for additional information? You mentioned a couple of resources, if you wouldn't mind um, reiterating those. And also, if they have other questions for you, is there, are there other ways that they can, um, they can reach you? Sure. So the American um, Academy of Allergy and Immunology is a very good website that you can find information on uh, food allergy prevention. You can also contact them for patient information leaflets. They are very happy to mail those out to various clinics so that uh, you have leaflets that you can give to your families who want more information on allergenic food introduction. Um, a lot of the information is also available online, so you could just download and make copies if you prefer. And I work at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor, so you can find me through the um, internet system and the emailing system with my name. It's uh, I'm I'm fairly accessible. That's wonderful, and it's uh it's wonderful that you would offer everyone your you know the opportunity to reach out to you directly, and also for taking the time to go through all this material today. Um, as is pretty clear, there's still a lot of there are a lot of questions out there and confusion as the recommendations are rapidly changing. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Anagnostu, for your time and uh, in developing this presentation for your colleagues. It was a pleasure. And I also want to thank everybody for joining and um, any help that you need, don't hesitate to contact our allergy team. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone. Have a great day.